Hi, I'm Martin Brockett, and I'm delighted to be first up today. Thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present a summary of my dissertation on Save Men, completed as part of the Emlet Viking Studies at the University of Highlands and Islands. When setting out into Viking studies, I never expected that I would discover and fall in love with the Icelandic sagas, and this study is very much based on instances of saved men in certain sagas. So as we walk through the findings today, I believe we're on reasonably firm ground in saying this is an examination of how the sagas portray Viking Age sorcerers and magic use, hence taking our understanding back to the time of saga authorship in the 12th to 16th centuries. But we're on much less safe ground if we assert that this is an accurate description of what actually happened during the Viking Age. But I did bring other types of evidence to bear on the literary elements where they were available. For example, if the sagas demonstrate that certain kinds of sorcerers have a tendency to, be, to become stoned to death, as safe men do, then the discovery of staff-bearing skeletons squashed under big flat stones in Scandinavia would give some weight to the sagas being a reasonably accurate depiction of certain real Viking Age behaviours and events. So where did all this start? Hems Kringler tells us that on a bright sunny morning around AD 998, King Olaf Tryggvason, the first Christian king of Norway, stands on the rocks overlooking the skerries of Abathness. Below him, Avon Kelder and at least 30 men are shivering tight to stakes at Olaf's command. All know they will drown as the tide comes in. Now, there are two similar accounts of Eivind in Heimskringla and Olaf Tryggvason's saga, and Mester. He leads a community of save men, workers of sather magic. He's first persecuted by King Olaf Tryggvason, who tricks Ivan's followers into being burnt to death. However, Eivind escapes through a hole in the ceiling of the hall where they're feasting. Later, Eivind and his followers attack King Olaf at Abarthsness. Eivind casts a spell, the sorcerer's darkness, but this is reflected back on him when he saw the holy church, and he and his men are captured and executed by drowning, as you can see in this uh, amazing woodcut illustration here. I started asking questions. Who were those men? Who was Avind? What had they done to deserve such punishment? And when you start asking such questions, this story rapidly becomes more intriguing. Avind is described as the great grandson of Harald Feinherr, arguably the first king of Norway. But so was Olaf Tryggvason, a great grandson of Harald Feinherr. So the execution of Avind and his followers may have little to do with wizardry and religion, and more to do with the removal of a rival claimant to the throne. And the location of Avaldsnes is not random, it's a burial site of Norwegian kings, one of the main residences that the early travelling kings would visit regularly, and it's still used in Norwegian ceremonies right to this day. So, how did I do all this? If you think of the words wizards, witches, illusionists, conjurers, prestigidators, sorcerers, mages, magicians, all words that describe some kind of worker of magic, but perhaps used interchangeably these days. But when you think about particular magicians, such as David Blaine, you might not ascribe every one of these labels to him, suggesting the words have a deeper meaning that perhaps we have now lost. And just as the Inuit are reputed to have more terms for the description of snow than the English, because snow is a concept more important for them, arguably, it might be expected that Old Norse has more terms for sorcerers. And this led me to Neil Price on page 83 of The Viking Way, where he lists a taxonomy of all the terms for sorcerer used in Old Norse literature. And what this study does is dig deeper into just one of these terms, save men, to discover if there was a shared meaning of this term and if this meaning can shed light on a coherent role for save men during the Viking Age. Using the wonderful Old Norse prose resource, I was able to pick out any instances of save men in the texts and then examine any description of their magical activities. I then examined the evidence for coherency in the portrayals of save men as if they are to have a coherent role, then they should demonstrate some similarities in the aspects listed here on the slide. 
I also used articles documenting archaeological finds dating to the 9th and 10th centuries, which could be interpreted as evidence of Viking Age magical activity. So Old Norse sagas written in the 12th to the 16th century, well, they're viewing the 9th and 10th centuries, the Viking Age, through the lens of Christianity. And the most important author is Snorri Sturluson, who, as well as authoring multiple sagas, gave us most of what we know about the Old Norse pagan beliefs in the form of his Eddas. So my perspective on the sagas evolved considerably over the time of this study. They are murky and troublesome sources for the scholar. They detail, the detail they give makes it tempting to believe that there is an accurate retelling of historical events passed down by our oral history. There's a lot to make us suspicious, however, uh, but I think we can land on an agreement that any coherency we find likely means a shared meaning of a word or concept existed at the time of the saga's writing. Whether that can be applied to the Viking Age is another leap, which usually needs some additional evidence to support. So as an example, uh, in the story we've just related about Olaf Tryggvason and the Savemen of Eivind Krelda, which it feels like something a historian can interpret as a credible story of a real event. But in the very next chapter, King Olaf is visited by an old man with a wide brim hat and one eye, and they have a question and answer session reminiscent of Odin in Gilfaginny. And distinguishing what may have been the story of a real event and what may not is a somewhat perilous activity. Okay, so let's look at some of the analysis that occurred during the study. Table one here shows all the terms that Neil Price puts in the category of male sailor worker. So if I wanted to get some insight into the use of the term in the Viking Age, however, I needed to exclude some of the sagas which are unrelated to the Viking Age. Actually, it's interesting that most of these terms do relate to the Viking Age sagas as opposed to a term like spamavira, which it's used mostly in other categories of sagas to describe Christian priests and prophets. Many sagas are adaptations of stories set outside of the Viking Age, both in terms of timescales and geography. So using the categorization from Lars Lonroth's work, I decided to focus on three categories of saga, the Icelandic saga, the King sagas, and the legendary sagas. And table two shows the 14 instances of save men in those selected sources. Uh, those are now in the scope of the study. In table three, we list the sorcerers identified as save men. So Avin Kelder, we've already met. He's described as the crown son of Romvald Rettelbeine, mostly translated as Rattlebone, the son of Harold Fairhair by his Sami wife, Snefrida and hence the highest status side mother identified here. Bitgear appears in the same story as Ronvald in Heimskringla. King Harold sent him a behest to leave off his wizardry, but Vitgear replies that if Ronvald can be a save man, then so can he, even though he is of lower status. The name Vitgear could derive from Vitki, a wizard, so this does perhaps cast doubt on his credibility as of being a real historical character. In Laxdale's saga, we meet the family of Kotkel from the Hebrides, and I'll describe them in more detail in a moment. In Bartha's saga, two saved men, Kroko and Krekia, literally meaning hook and crack, are hired by none other than Olaf Tryggvason again to break into a mound and retrieve some treasure. The saved men's somewhat comical efforts are equipped by a Christian priest who gets that job done. Uh, but note the paradox here of Olaf hiring saved men in one saga and destroying them in another. In Sturlunga saga, which is the only legendary saga featuring the term saved men, a prince finds three saved men inside a mound, no real idea what they're doing in there, and he solicits a charm or spell from them. We also find Thorgrim Neff, a high-ranking farmer or bonder in Gisla Saga, who uses magic and smithcraft to create an enchanted spear, and he lives with his sister Ordbjorg, who also practices magic, although she is not explicitly termed a Saithman. Finally, a group of unnamed Saithmen accompany King Huglik in Inglinger Saga. 
So next, I explored the Old Norse terms that describe the magical activities of saved men, and I found five, and it's helpful to describe them in a bit more detail here. So Seder occurs only once as an activity of saved men, and this uh, is ascribed to the death of Krut's son in Laxdale Saga, which we'll come to in a moment. So meaning cord, string or snare is a very specific form with shamanistic overtones and the origin appears to come from the story in Ingling saga where Odin acquires Seder from the priestess. Um, we believe that is Freya and Odin can predict the fates of men and things that have not yet happened, disaster or disease, and take wit or strength from some and give it to others. So you notice there's some specific activities there included in Seder. Galder definitely is the big ticket magic, so we'll see an example of a ship being sunk. Um, so blizzards, large waves and powerful curses conducted through the singing of high-pitched incantations. Uh, so this word of two elements, uh, the kuna element from no or known or knowledge, and then fjol or fjal might be the mountain or fell, so you get this lovely interpretation as mountain knowledge. And who lives in the mountains? Well, not the Scandinavians, that's really either the Sami or supernatural beings. And then fiol or much many, so wise or a lot of knowledge. And, and all of these words tend to have a connection with wisdom of some kind. Then the last two, uh, so this is both a legal term, meaning a decision or sentence, but it also has this supernatural meaning of a decree of fate or spell, or it could mean the fear of a sorcerer's gaze. Um, it's a curse. It can also involve weather magic, and the main example relating to this study is the blasting of a field by Stigandi in Laxdae, the saga. So clearly you have to be able to see what you're cursing, and there are a couple of examples where, in order to prevent that, a sack is put over the sorcerer's head. Uh, in the case of the Finnish wizards teaching Gunhild, they specifically mention sealskin sacks, so possibly the sealskin has an element of um, magical property. But in Laxdale Saga, unfortunately, the sack has a rent in it, which means that Stigandi can unleash his curse. Finally, Gurningar. This again has links to legal terms, so we have to think a little bit about how close the role of a law speaker or law expert and a sorcerer was in the minds of the writer uh, but definitely etymological links to legal terms but in sorcerous actions it might be a deed or an act of wizardry also so i looked at where each of these terms are used in relation to the save men we are studying um, what you can see is a fairly even distribution, but Fjolkunig definitely the most common term, and that could possibly really be that Fjolkunig was a generic term for sorcery, and the others have more specific meanings to the audience. But the results are a little counterintuitive because only once are saved men described as performing saver, whereas in other cases we have these other terms which I was less familiar with. Of course there is the explanation that Old Norse terms were interchangeable in the minds of the authors, but I believe that this is not the case and that the author is trying to convey that a certain kind of magic is being practiced. So let's also look at the effects of these magical activities and what you can see here is that again uh, we have some categories represented and some not so the ability to kill directly which is quite unusual for descriptions of magical activities uh, kill via the elements like the waves or uh, a storm 
uh, creating fear and confusion in battle, um, enchanting weapons, and another intriguing one is around entering or robbing burial mounds, suggesting that saved men have a role to play in the transition between life and death. Um, but certainly later on, they were seen as the right people to hire if you needed to get into a burial mound and acquire the contents therein. Interestingly as well, uh, we don't see any shape changing, healing or divination. So a lot of the stories regarding female sailor workers or the Voller uh, do not overlap with the activities of sailor men. So let's look more closely at Blacksdale saga. In this wonderful saga, Kotkel and his family appear in Iceland from the Hebrides and they're taken in by Halstein, a local government or Gothi, sorry, a local chiefman, chieftain or Gothi, who immediately tasks them with discrediting his enemies. Now the local community dislike them intensely and one runs to her son Thord in another valley for his help. Thord moves his mother and her livestock, but Kotkel finds this insulting and starts casting spells described as Galdra, the big ticket spells, often weather magic and in the context of battles. Now, Avin's shadow spell is also described as a Galdra in Heimskringer. Later, having moved to another area and following a dispute over some horses, Kotkel builds a platform, a Seidhala, or say the chair, if you like, and starts chanting near Hrut, the local farmer's house. The chants lure Hrut's son Kari out of the house, he's just 12 years old, and he's struck dead on the spot. So, very upset by that, the community is motivated to stop Kotkel. They pursue his family to death by stoning or drowning, but not before Stigandi, Kotkel's son, destroys a field with his Akhvedi curse. Um, So Galdas has been thought to be different from Sather, but in Laxdale's saga, Sathemen are portrayed as using both types of sorcery. So there's lots going on here. It's important to avoid a Sather mother's gaze, and I can't help wondering if that is why Avon Kelder and his men are drawn looking out to sea. Multiple sources agree that it's important when capturing Viking Age wizards to put a sack over their heads to prevent the curse, seal or whale skin sacks being particularly helpful here. So having explored the depiction of Sathemen in the sagas, let's explore some areas where we found high levels of coherency between these portrayals. And one of these is foreign heritage. Viking Age sorcerers are often depicted as wandering itinerants with some taint of foreign heritage available for hire suggesting they're outside the boundaries of decent society and hence low status dependent on the Scandinavian ruling class for work for which they're paid. But closer examination of Sathemen as a category reveals they are mostly high status. Sathemen are often attributed foreign heritage, especially a connection with the Sami people. They're a Finno-Ugric tribe who lived alongside the Scandinavians in central and northern Norway. The Sami practiced a shamanic faith common to many sub-Arctic peoples, and that could be observed by researchers that went to the area as late as the 19th century. Uh, but they're the subject of a lot of distrust and magical influence in Old Norse literature. And the most illuminating example of this is Avin's great-grandmother and Ronvald Rattlebone's mother, Queen Snaefleather, the wife of Harold Fairhair. So Heimskringner tells us that Harold Finehair loved Snaefrida so madly that his kingdom and all his duties he then neglected. After bearing Harold a son, Ronvald, Snaefrida died, the author giving one possible implication that she died in childbirth or soon after. It's suggested that Snaefrida has enchanted Harold with her Sami wiles. Her corpse remains intact and ruddy for three years, whilst Harold hopes for her return to life and neglects his kingly duties. Finally, Harold's advisor, Thorleif Spaki, which is uh, the law speaker intervening here, interestingly, he recommends that the corpse is removed from her bed, at which point it quickly decomposes. 
Snaefrida descended to ashes, and Harold ascends to wisdom and turns his mind from folly. So this Sami enchantment is an important prelude to Ronvald's life, and the reader of Heimskringla is later reminded that Eivin Kelder, as a direct descendant of Ronvald, is also tainted with this Sami ancestry. We find this concept applied also to Gunghild Kingsmother, the uh, wife of Eric Bloodaxe. So in one story, she's the daughter of the King of Denmark, but in another, she, uh, in Heimskringla particularly, she is the daughter of uh, the Horderlander Oza Toti. So this is the area where Ronbald used to live also, and she lives among the Sami and the Finns. So how can Eivind and Ronvald be simultaneously Norwegian royalty and foreign wandering wizards? Well, 200 years later, how could a Christian author such as Snorri reconcile religion and tradition? Um, it's quite possible he wanted to talk about his cultural history and ancestry, but these violent deeds of his ancestors would not be easy to reconcile with his Christian values. So one answer suggested by Clooney's Ross would be to justify it on the grounds of a vice learnt from foreigners. So this wizardry would be tainted in a way and that allowed the author to describe it to his Christian audience without fear of criticism. So another aspect uh, that displayed high co coherency during the study is the performance of magic. So firstly, where we read about the performance of everything except the Akvedi curse, the performance is planned. So we have some literary evidence for the Saith Halla chair on a raised platform, especially in this depiction of Kotkel's magical activities in Laxdala Saga. And you can get some idea of how this might have looked from the illustration here. Other raised locations are used, such as climbing on a roof, suggesting that magic must strike downwards in some way. We also get some idea of the sound of the magical chanting, Again from Laxdale's saga, we hear that the auditory performance, the save lady chants, were sweet to the ear. And we also have the poetic style of Galdralog, which may well be related to magical activity. Exactly what this sounds like is less easy to define, but it's just possible that the by name of Avin Kelder gives us a clue here. We have uh, a bird called the Keldu Svita or water snipe, and that has a lovely ululating sound, which could be imagined to relate to this activity. So we've got no lightning bolts from a wizard's hands here. The magic is spun or sung or chanted into something that then alters reality, often in a different location from where the caster is, and often just after the magical performance rather than exactly in time with it. Only the Act Veli curse is portrayed as not requiring preparation, hence the fear of the Saved Mother's gaze and the importance of putting a sack over their head on capture. So props such as a Saver staff may be required, whilst most mentions of a wizard's staff in the sagas relate to female voleur, for example the prophetess um, Thjorberg Little Volva in Eric the Red Saga, a staff is not explicitly used by any of the saved men in this study. However, a staff is used by the male sorcerer Lodmund in Lodmunda the Old in Landnamabok, described as a Fjölkuniga. In this case, details of a ritual are recorded during a magical battle with another sorcerer to divert floodwaters from their farms. Put the point of my staff into the water, he said. There was a ferrule on the staff, and Lodman held the staff with both hands and bit the ferrule. So that's the circular ring on the top, as you can see, and the illustration on the left. Lodman's not explicitly a saved mother, but as a sorcerer conducting elemental magic, he does have some resemblance to one. So what's the significance of the staff? Well, there's been over 50 and the 
a lot of research on say the staff and their use in say the performances particularly by Lachette Gardea. In some cases uh, his work indicates that say the workers were buried alongside other townsfolk or in high state burials. Many say the staffs are found in bogs and religious areas so it's quite challenging to draw firm conclusions as the as to the integration of say the workers into wider society from this evidence. But the staff of sorcery has mainly been categorised as a feminine implement due to its presence in graves such as Oseberg with bone sexed as female. It has been related to Vola via its definition. It's uh, the Old Norse Vulva or a female staff bearer, the plural of which is Vola. Uh, and this etymological link to Vola, a round stick or staff. But if magic is done on a platform, then this would need a hall of some size, perhaps a noble hall. And if so, who is performing it? So the Old Norse word for a chieftain or Gothi, or it's also the word for a heathen priest. And certainly in Christian times, we see that the local chieftain is responsible for the observance of religious festivals. And that may well have been the case in pre-Christian times as well. There's little evidence for a separate priest class outside of the great temples, such as Uppsala. And some sources suggest that magical activity was indeed part of the normal duties of a Viking Age Jarl or Gothi or Chieftain. Now, Sathemen don't move around much, so they're not actually itinerant wanderers, wanderers, according to these portrayals, unless they're forced to by persecution. So the performance of magic and rituals by high status individuals occurring in noble halls suggests that the role of saved men and other sailor workers could have been a thread running through the centre of Viking Age communities, which would conflict greatly with the portrayal of saved men as being outside society. And finally, there's the work of Terry Gunnell on liminal spaces and the suggestion being that in the hall we create a liminal space which uh, as the magic chants and ceremony goes on that we create a space that is dreamlike or moving outside of reality uh, in which the magic can exist. The final element that showed high coherency in the study, which I'll discuss here in more detail, is their legal status and persecution. So we have a number of legal codes from Iceland and Norway, such as Gragas Laws of Early Iceland and the Gulating Laws in Norway. And that gives us some insight into the legal mindset of Viking Age Scandinavia. So these laws specifically prescribe magical activities and they're punishable mostly by outlawry. And they specifically forbid all of the magical terms ascribed to Seyth men that we've discussed, apart from Seyther itself, which does make you wonder if Seyther was somehow more acceptable or was not considered spell casting exactly. There appears to be a correct way to execute Sathemen, that's either stoning or drowning. And the stoning theme is shown in several stories, Kotkel's family, Thorgrim Neff and his sister Ordbjörg. And there is a tentative link here to archaeological evidence of burials in Denmark, such as that of Bogobe pictured here. Uh, we note that Olaf drowns Eivind and also the grisly end of Gunhild, King's mother, in a bog. Uh, but the picture here shows a corpse under stones and Gardea has also identified that certain, say the staffs, are buried under large stones as if there has been an attempt to break or kill the staff just as uh, swords are often broken at burial. It's possible that staffs were treated in the same way. So here's all the highly coherent aspects of Save Men portrayals that I found in the study. We've discussed the top three um, briefly where 
describe sailors always learnt from a female in the family so that's uh, an interesting one there's definitely a tendency towards similar types of magical activities very much aggressive magic and not healing or divinations and um, they're always in groups be it a family a small band or as larger groups yarls with save men pretty much replacing the huskal retinue then less coherent but with some merit to pursue the social class and status we have the high status group uh, we also have these a lot of safe men described in somewhat ambiguous but they are definitely being hired by kings or royalty and are able to mix with them the difference here is that the high status group are always acting for themselves so Ronveld, Avind and Thorgrim in particular uh, the undefined status group are always hired by these male high status figures in terms of save men being male or female so two of the save men we investigated are female so there's Kotkel's wife in Laxdale saga and there is little evidence for deviancy uh, we have just one instance of save men being described as ergi that's that's thorgrim neff but there is really nothing in the text that we can see as a save men behaving in a perverse or sexually deviant manner so in conclusion then um the role of save men that this study identified is likely to have been a distinct type of sorcerer in the minds of saga writers and if we try to look at what that might have meant in the Viking Age, the role of save men is likely to have been mainstream to society rather than outside of it, at least prior to Christianization. We see save men being high or mid social status with multiple roles. So um, one could be a save man and a warrior, save man and a wizard, sorry, save man and a smith, or save man and a uh, a local leader um, that makes things extremely interesting as they would definitely appear to be very much central they would have access to halls and these expensive props uh, like a staff they are definitely of great concern to royalty especially as we approach Christianization and they are not specifically deviant according to the evidence examined here their magical activities center on aggressive weather magic death magic curses and not healing or divination and um, the portrayal of saved men in the sagas does illustrate this conflict between trying to portray one's cultural history and the one's current religion and i believe this portrayal as foreign or deviant allows the saga author to describe their magical activities without legitimizing them so i'll leave it there and we open for questions the one specific question that i recall is any difference between the portrayal of saved men and save kona that was from shay richardson and i did speculate that the agency is different here that the save mother were able to directly influence reality and cause actions whereas the save kona are more involved with divinations and therefore predicting outcomes of reality but not necessarily being the actors in them which we thought was quite interesting